My name is Jim Osmanski, and I am a, uh, a sleep doctor. So I'm a pulmonary and critical care and sleep doctor. And uh, I've been in Bozeman now for about four years. And uh, I've given this, this talk once before, so, or a similar talk. And um, I thought today what we do is, is talk a little bit about uh, sleep, uh, what it means, um, and then uh, talk about what happens if you don't get enough sleep and how it affects your body. We won't necessarily uh, talk about any disease process per se, other than what happens when you don't get enough sleep. So, now, there's been a lot of misconceptions about sleep over the ages, and this one typifies, you know, uh, um, uh, some of the thoughts about sleep. Um, and uh, it turns out that, that for most of the past thousand years or so, people really kind of thought of sleep as being a passive process where you just kind of go to sleep and you're, you're dormant and then you wake up and everything's okay. And it turns out that's anything but the truth. Um, the, the comments I also get from people uh, all the time is that, you know, a lot of times they get sent uh, to see me because they've got some sort of breathing problem at night when they go to sleep. And sleep apnea is one of those breathing, breathing problems. And, and uh, very commonly what people say to me is that that's a new thing and it's been made up. Uh, so that, uh, you know, I mean, why should we pay attention to a, a made up problem? So what I thought I'd do today is very quickly uh, do a historical perspective about sleep. It won't be comprehensive, but it'll pick on a, a, pick a couple of high points. And then I talk about, uh, you know, uh, what sleep is, what it looks like for us. Um, talk about some of the things that happen as we age. Uh, and then talk about what happens when we don't get enough sleep. And there's, uh, so that, that, should, that should cover the hour. So it turns out that Hippocrates and Aristotle, who really kind of started medicine, uh, lived uh, 2,500 years ago, a long time ago, and they actually observed that, that people sleep, every animal slept, that Aristotle observed that. And Hippocrates, uh, you know, all doctors take the Hippocratic Oath, uh, Hippocrates actually said that there were, there were uh, sleep disturbances and he recorded in his writings that, that people actually seemed to choke and suffocate when they were asleep. And they rolled around and talked and did other things. So his observations were, were some of the first in the literature. Um, you know, there was a, a famous uh, king in one of the Greek Isles, uh, Dionysius, that, that lived around uh, uh, lived around 1000 BC that, that is written down as, as having a servant uh, stick pins. And he was known for his gluttony. He was morbidly obese and he'd fall asleep at times. And uh, when he did so, he'd stop breathing. So he had a servant that would stick a pin in him and wake him up when that occurred. Um, but nobody really wrote about this very much until the, the 1800s, actually, and where Charles Dickens wrote a book called The Posthumous Papers of the Pickwick Club. And he had a character in there that clearly had sleep apnea. And he was called Joe the Fat Boy. And he sat on a box in a corner in red-faced somnolency, so asleep in the corner. Um, now, we didn't start, we didn't know what happened to the brain um, and what was going on until we had a way to kind of record what was going on there. Um, and it turns out that there was a, there was a, a German uh, doctor back in the 1920s who had a near-death experience. And he, he had this, uh, this uh, connection to his sister and he imagined that he, this near-death experience in a motor vehicle uh, crash occurred because he um, got uh, telepathic visions and, and warning from his sister. And after this crash, he actually sat down with an electrode and tried to figure out whether uh, he could map the brain. And it took him actually quite a while, and he invented what's now called the EEG, the electroencephalogram. Um, and he was such a secretive, kind of a weird guy, uh, he actually kept it secret for about nine years until somebody else invented it, and then he published it. Uh, but that's, that's how we first started looking at brain waves. And up until that time, it was really kind of thought of that the, the brain just kind of went out and nothing really happened up there. Um, you know, on the, on the uh, disease end of it, in 1937, there was a first actual recorded in the medical literature, a case of a patient that clearly had obstructive sleep apnea and developed failure. And he had a funny breathing pattern that, that we call chain stokes respiration after two doctors from the 1800s that identified this type of breathing, where people breathe 
uh, slowly, uh, shallowly, and then they breathe faster and faster and deeper and deeper, and then they repeat the process. They go down and they, they finally take a, take a pause in their breathing and, and have, an, have what we call an apnea. So this was actually in 1937, but the term sleep apnea, even though they observed it, didn't get coined until 1975. Now, back in the 30s again, uh, the first people that actually started to rigorously look at this one came out of Chicago. And there was a doctor named Nathaniel Kleitman, uh, who was a researcher. And in 1938, he took a group of his uh, medical student colleagues down into a cave. And they were down about a mile. And they stayed down there for a couple of months. And they did experiments in each other. Rectal temperatures, uh, you know, took heart rates, took blood pressures, and things like that. And um, they were the first to actually discover that sleep is actually a fairly active process. And that things happen, blood pressure change, heart rate change, respirations change. Um, so, and they were intrigued by that. And actually some of the, a lot of the modern uh, sleep uh, uh, theories came out of Dr. Kleitman's office. So he's, uh, or his uh, studies, and he's actually uh, termed the, the father of sleep medicine. So this goes back 80 years. Now, he had a young medical student in the 50s uh, named uh, William DeMent, and he's, you guys may have heard of him. He's written several books, and he's actually still around. I saw him two weeks ago uh, at our national meeting. And um, in 1953, when he was working for Dr. Kleitman, he noticed that when they hooked cats up and cats fell asleep, that the eyes seemed to move. And he said, well, that's pretty funky. I never noticed that before. And then they, they actually tried it on humans, and they, they sure enough, as humans fell asleep, they saw the eyes moving back and forth. And they, they, they put electrodes on, they put the EEG on there, and they found that, yeah, the eyes were going back and forth. And they, but the brain wave looked like the, the brain was awake, and they called it paradoxical sleep. They're asleep, and yet they're awake. And they identified what we call rapid eye movement sleep. Now, we all know that now. You guys have probably heard about that, REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. But in 1953, it was brand new, nobody knew about it. Now, um, in kind of current times, uh, 1989, it uh, was the first uh, textbook in medicine. You know, to put that in context, uh, you know, there are scrolls for medicine on how to take care of people for a variety of different things that go back a thousand years. And, you know, modern textbooks uh, started being written in the, in the 16 and 1700s, and we still use them. You know, Digitalis was, was recorded in the 1700s, so there's a lot of things. But sleep was, thir you know, 30 years ago. And, you know, for context, uh, that's, that book was published after I was already done medical school. So um, what I got in medical school was, you know, I remember one lecture in physiology where we spent about 10 minutes on sleep, and they said there's this thing called non-REM sleep and REM sleep. And, and heart rate did this, and respirations did that, and we wrote down furiously, and that was it. So in four years, I had about 20 minutes of, of, uh, of stuff in sleep. It just wasn't that important. And in fact, you know, it turns around in, in Harvard, uh, I'm sorry, at Harvard uh, University back in 2006, they surveyed every medical school in the country. And they said, well, how much time do you actually devote to sleep in your four years of medical curriculum? And the, the average was two hours. The average was two hours. The longest was four. Now there's over a hundred sleep disorders, okay? And uh, the most recent textbook, this is my copy of this, the most recent version, we're now in sixth edition, has 1,700 pages in it. And, and most people get less than two hours of education on this. So, you know, there's a saying in medical school that what you don't learn in medical school isn't important. And it's for that reason that many of the doctors that we, that are my colleagues, really don't get it. They don't understand sleep because it's never been thought to be important. It's the other thing that we do. Okay. Now, so what, what is sleep? What is this thing? Well, sleep is uh, what we call a reversible behavioral state of perceptual disengagement from and unresponsiveness to the environment. And unlike coma, uh, it's physiologic, it's recurrent, and it's reversible. When Merle falls asleep over here, I can walk over, kick his chair, and wake him up. And, and to some extent, um, you know, that, that is a very normal response to me or not, okay? So now there are different states of uh, being inside, the, uh, uh, inside all mammals. There's wake, there's non-REM sleep, and there's REM sleep. We've talked about that for a minute. And the way we figured this stuff out is by looking at the EEG, the brain waves. We look at the eye waves, 
and we look at muscle tension. And then, you know, if, if, if Merle looks like he's asleep, then he probably is asleep. Um, so we also look at that. And we use these, uh, these things in the laboratory. Now, it turns out that unlike, uh, unlike we thought before Dr. Clayton uh, took his medical students into the cave, it turns out that the brain is actually a fairly active process. I'm sorry, sleep is a fairly active process. And it turns out that, that inside this brain, we have a variety of different centers in the brain. And, and what's really cool about this is that, is that the centers talk to each other and they use chemicals. And in wake, some of the chemicals go up and some of the chemicals go down. And in sleep, some of the chemicals go up and some of the chemicals go down. And what tends to happen is that as the sleep occurs, it sends, it sends uh, signals up to the thinking part of the brain to put it to sleep. And then as soon as you go to sleep, that part of the brain starts to tell uh, wake to start happening again. So this is a continuous cycle of, of going to sleep and waking up. It happens all day long. Okay. Now if we look at uh, uh, Dr. Berger's uh, contraption here, the EEG, uh, we can see that there's different waves. So here's somebody that's awake. This is a, this is a brain wave, and you can see them here on this patient. This is, this is what we look like when we're getting a sleep study. Um, so uh, we have things that go under the nose, uh, things that go on the chin. Uh, there's a microphone that we put here. Uh, there's bands that go across the chest and abdomen to re uh, measure respiration. We follow the heart rate here. We look at the EEG, and all this stuff gets connected to one box. And that looks like, that's a lot of spaghetti. I'm never going to be able to sleep. Well, it turns out that people do pretty well, you know. At about 10 minutes after I put my glasses on, or I put them on top of my head, I can't find them. So that, that's what happens here when you have your sleep study, is that we put this stuff on, and after a couple of minutes, you, you forget about it, you go to sleep, and it's a minor annoyance, but people do pretty well. Now, all these wires that, that, uh, um, that get connected here actually have one wire coming out the other end of it. So if you have to pee in the middle of the night, you just let us know, we disconnect that one wire, and, and you're off to the races. But what we're looking for while you're asleep is to the different waves. So here's your drowsy, and here's first stages of sleep. Okay, so it kind of mellows out here, not as spiky. And then here's the workhorse. We have most, most of our sleep looks like this. Um, and that's, that's a, a, a sleep that, that tends to regenerate us. And here's a sleep, and we'll talk about this more in the lecture, uh, here's a sleep that actually is, is very uh, restorative and regenerative, and we call this one delta sleep. It goes by different names, so if you read something in, a, in an older magazine, you'll see things that's called it slow wave sleep. But, but all of these things are basically the same, big waves that come about. And here's, here's rapid eye movement sleep. Now, I don't have the eyes to show you, but we'd be seeing the eyes going back and forth. But here, look at this one. Look at that line here, and look at wake. And look how similar it is. And that's why when Dr. Dement first looked at it, um, he couldn't tell whether the patient, uh, whether the cat and then the human was awake or asleep. And that's why they called it paradoxical sleep. Now, as I said, there's different physiologic responses that occur during sleep. So we know that the brain signals the body in a variety of different ways. And we see that, that when we're in non-REM sleep, we, we have a regular heart rate. We have a regular respiratory rate. Our blood pressure is regular. And our skeletal muscle tone is, is preserved. We can roll around, we can cough, we can do other things. We see that our brain oxygen consumption, so is our, how is our brain doing? Is it resting? Yeah, it's actually reduced. It's resting. We're using less energy. Response to carbon dioxide. So if I put a pillow over your head, and what are you going to do if you're in non-REM sleep? Well, it's the same as awake. You're going to fight that pillow. You're going to try and breathe harder. Oxygen, when you have a low oxygen level, it's the same thing. Now, how about temperature? So if, I, if you have a thermometer on me and I'm in non-REM sleep, um, I'm going to be homeothermic, meaning that my body temperature is going to be, uh, is going to be nice and steady, 98.6, right? So it's going to be 98.6. And then, and then here's a key variable, is that in guys, the penis becomes firm, and in ladies, vaginal engorgement occurs. Not in REM sleep. I'm sorry, not in non-REM sleep, but in REM sleep. And that's one of the ways that you can tell that you're actually getting a good night's sleep, that you've had REM sleep if you wake up with an erection. That's a good sign. So it turns out that in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, that's when the brain is really active. Your heart rate's irregular, your respiratory rate's irregular, 
The blood pressure can go up and down depending on what type of REM sleep you have. And, and the key thing here, and the way that Dr. Dement figured this out, was that he put EMG, so he measured how active the muscles were. And what he found out was that during uh, REM sleep, muscle tone is absent. Our muscles are flaccid. Why would that be? Well, if our brain is active and we're dreaming, that's when REM occurs, and you're dreaming, if I'm fighting a tiger in a dream and I've got my muscles intact, I'm going to fight the tiger and I might bop my wife. So what we have is we have absent muscle tone, and that's what we actually do. In the laboratory, you watch and see. When your eyes start going crazy and you look like you're awake, we look at your chin and we'll see whether your chin tone is down. We'll actually see increased brain oxygen consumption. So unlike non-REM sleep, your brain is actually active. It's using up energy. Carbon dioxide levels depress. So if I put a pillow over your mouth, before you actually wake up and stir, your, your carbon dioxide level is going to rise. But your blood pressure, I'm sorry, but your oxygen level is going to stay the same. And then there's this thing called poikilothermia. So who's had the best dream of the night, wakened up, and found that their skin was cold? Their shoulders were cold, they're uncovered, the blankets are off, and your skin is cold. Yeah, so I got one hand. Come on, you guys have all had this. All right. So that's called poikilothermia. And what that means is that you're, you're in REM sleep. Your body temperature is trying to reach the surrounding temperature. And that's why we tell you to sleep in a, in a comfortable uh, temperature. If you sleep when it's really cold and you're uncovered, when you hit REM sleep, you're going to wake up because you're going to be cold. And your brain's going to say, hey, guy, wake up, close the window, put a cover on. And you'll interrupt REM sleep. OK? So now we have this organization of sleep. And we have this wake and non-REM sleep. And REM sleep, we've already talked about it. Well, it turns out that it's, it's pretty fluid. It goes back and forth. And some of you guys are right here right now, wake and non-REM sleep. You're dozing off. I see your heads bobbing. Okay. Now, you won't do REM sleep because REM sleep doesn't happen when you take a brief nap unless you've got a disease process. And the disease processes occur in wake, in non-REM, and in REM. But one of the, a couple of the things that we'll see is um, where this REM, non-REM sleep and wake overlap. So uh, sleepwalking, sleep talking, you guys have heard of that, probably experienced it. So that's a parasomnia, a funny, funny thing uh, that occurs at the sleep-wake transition. And then in REM sleep, we have the, we have the same thing. So the sleep-wake transition that goes into REM is where people will do funny things called REM behavior disorder, where they'll act out their dreams. Um, the, and it's also where people with narcolepsy have their, have their problem. They'll go from wake right into REM sleep back into wake, and that's abnormal. Now, if you look at how we sleep and, and what percentage of the sleep we have, it actually changes throughout our lifetime. And now this, the, so that we have, so neonate means a newborn, okay? And then we have infants and children and adolescents and adults and finally old age, okay? And what we see is that as we're born, for the first two to four months or so, um, we go right into sleep and we go right into rapid eye movement sleep. So for the first two to four months, that's the only time when you should have REM sleep as soon as you go to sleep. And you'll see it, if you guys have kids and grandkids, when they go to sleep and they're, you know, they've suckled on mom's breast or you gave them a bottle and they go to sleep, you'll see them suckle a little bit and then their eyes will start going back and forth. And that's normal, they're in REM sleep. And that's, that tends to go away as we age, such that by the time we're you know, children and adolescents, certainly by the time we're adults, about a quarter of our sleep is that rapid eye movement sleep, and the rest of it is this non-REM sleep. And that relationship changes, but we need less sleep as we age. And you'll see that there, okay? Now, we also have things that's called, or a thing called sleep architecture, meaning that there are cycles to uh, REM sleep and non-REM sleep. And there's a fairly predictable way to go and a normal way to go. So here I am awake, and then I go to sleep, and it's a really light sleep. And then I go uh, into this deeper sleep, what's called three or four. It's all, this is an old slide, so it, it, it's how we used to call it. But that's that deep sleep, slow wave sleep. And what we see is the slow wave sleep in the first part of the night. Now that's critical because if you're a little kid, that's when some of your hormones get released, specifically growth hormones. So growth hormone is linked to slow wave sleep. And we see kids that have a ton of this stuff. Half the night is slow wave sleep. Why? It's because they're growing like crazy. And that, that 
um, that slow wave sleep signals to the brain to help to start growing. These black lines here are what's called REM sleep. And in REM sleep, we've already talked about it, you have it about 90 to 120 minutes after you go to sleep. It's abnormal if it comes shorter. It's abnormal if it goes later. So 90 to 120 minutes. And then every 90 to 120 minutes, you have a block of REM sleep. And it gets longer and longer throughout the night. And that's why you're having that great dream with a cold shoulder when the alarm rings. Okay, Because that's how REM sleep normally goes. So that's pretty normal. So what happens as we age? Well, it's not all the same. So little kids, we see that slow wave sleep. Look at it here. This little guy had a ton of it. He's growing like crazy. And he's got rapid eye movement sleep right where it's supposed to go. And as a young adult, you know, somebody in their 20s and 30s, they've got less of that slow wave sleep. They're fully, uh, they're fully grown. And then they've got this rapid eye movement sleep that comes. And, and it comes in a fairly predictable period. Now what happens when you become an old fart like me? So, um, what tends to happen is that we spend more time awake, it's harder to go to sleep. We spend less time in, in a, a slow wave sleep, and, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. And then we wake up more frequently. Wake up, you spend more time awake. And look at this, you have less REM sleep and it's more erratic. So as we age, the character of our sleep changes. And what we also see is that about the age of 75, napping because it becomes a biologic imperative. So it turns out that, that when we first uh, are born, newborns are up for a couple of hours, sleep for a couple of hours, up for a couple of hours. And you guys remember this, when you were exhausted and the baby wouldn't sleep for a, more than an hour or two. And then by the time you're one, you've got this long sleep period and two naps, two naps during the day. By about four years old, well, some kids, it's quite variable, but some kids will still nap twice uh, during the day. But usually by the time you're about ready to hit kindergarten, you're down to one nap. But by the time you're 10, you see, now you're sleeping something on the order of about 10 hours, and you wake up feeling pretty good. You know, kids typically go to bed sometime around 8, and they're, in bed, they're up around 6, and, and that's a fairly normal. But by the time they get into teenager years, and this, that's not included here, what we tend to see is that their bedtime shifts towards midnight, and their wake-up time shifts towards noon. You guys may be aware of you know, all the things that the school districts are doing around the country, where the, what we want to see is we want to see uh, the kids that go into eighth grade, ninth grade, that they that they be allowed to sleep later and go to bed later, particularly on Sunday. Okay, why? Because as as we age, our brains naturally do this. We start going to bed later, and we need to get up later, and that's a normal physiology. And by the time we hit our twenties, that shifts back, and now we do what a normal adult does. But if you guys are involved with the school district at all, or you have friends who are teachers. You can tell them that the reason that they need to vote on getting kids a later start time is that it's a biologic imperative. Now, if I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and I go about my day, I might be tired for a little while, but I'm going to be pretty good if I got a decent night's sleep. But if I take, a, if I take a, a, a teenager who's in high school and I get them up at 6 o'clock in the morning, it's like getting me up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay? And they just don't function. So what's happening? Well, our high school kids aren't doing very well. They're having trouble with school and they have to stay afterwards. And then on the other end of it, we're cramming them with homework because they, they have to succeed. Uh, and then they've got their social lives. So, so this, uh, this is a, a forgotten part in this slide that, that really needs to be talked about and taken care of. So what, what causes our patterns of sleep and sleepiness? So we've got two things. The first one is the homeostatic sleep drive and the circadian sleep drive. I'm gonna talk about these for a couple of minutes. So the homeostatic sleep drive is real simple. The longer you stay up, the easier it is to go to bed. And the longer you go to bed, the easier it is to stay up. It's as simple as that. Um, and some of that is mediated by what's called a neurotransmitter. I mean, it can't mean a chemical that helps drive all this stuff. And that's called adenosine. And, and adenosine is very nicely uh, inhibited by caffeine. And it doesn't take very much. And that's why we tell people that, you know, hey, listen, if you really want to go to sleep, you have to cut down on the, ca on the caffeine. Nicotine will do some of the same things, but through a different pathway. But the point is that, is that if you're taking a stimulant that, that adversely affects the chemical that helps you go to sleep, it doesn't make much sense. So why, why do we sleep? Why do we sleep? I mean, what, what's, what's this about the homeostatic sleep drive? 
Well, it turns out we don't actually know. We have no clue. But we're beginning to get a little bit of a clue. And, and part of it is through what's called this glymphatic system. Not lymphatic, like the lymph nodes, but glymphatic. And what that means is that we have a system in our brain that helps clear out toxic metabolites. So if you look at the skull, what, or this, this brain, what we're talking about is the periphery of the brain, right below the skull. And that's what this stuff represents. The subarachnoid space is one of those spaces that, that's above the brain but below the skull. And what happens is that when we go to sleep, but not when we're awake, we turn on a system that goes through convective flow, meaning that the artery pulses, and it pulses blood and stuff through the periphery of the brain to the vein. And at the point at the vein, it tends to clear that out. And when, as soon as I wake up, instantaneously that turns off. And as soon as I go to sleep, it's back on again. And what this thing clears out, and what it clears out from around the neurons, is it clears out all of the metabolites that we have from being awake, all of the things that have been kind of building up. So our brain runs on sugar. It loves sugar. And when, when, uh, when you break down sugar, there's different chemicals that, that, that are developed. Um, we also see that, that proteins, our, our brain runs on, run on, runs on proteins. And some of the byproducts of protein and, and cholesterol metabolism build up. Now it's very important that that stuff get cleared out. One of the things is called beta amyloid. Now you guys have heard of Alzheimer's type dementia, right? So um, one of the things is we, with dementia is we get things called amyloid plaques in our brain. And those amyloid means that you have, you have um, abnormal built up of chemicals and, and, and they, they kind of develop a complex. It's like a, you know, it's like the dryer lid you know, that you have in, in, when, you're, when you dry your clothes. It just kind of gets stuck. And the longer you sleep, the more likely you are to clear that stuff out. And what studies have shown is that, is that the shorter your sleep duration, the more likely you are to have that build up, and it's cumulative. So less sleep, more junk, less chemicals to help keep us awake and asleep and, and, uh, and feeling good and being able to think well. So this lymphatic system turns out to be very important. And you know, it comes back to that, well, you know, why didn't we know this before? That's actually something that's only been developed within or understood within the past year or two. But it's all, all kind of cutting edge stuff. Now, the other, the other system we have is called the circadian rhythm. And circadian circadias means about a day. And the circadian rhythm in humans uh, tends to be 24.2 hours long. So it's not actually 24 hours like we think. And there, you know this, there's times where, where uh, let me get oriented here, so here's midnight, and we get our deepest sleep around 2 in the morning, and the lowest body temperature of 4.30, why is that? Because we have REM sleep. And then mel melatonin secretion stops, bowel movements are likely as soon as you get up, that first cup of joe sends you to the can. Um, and then, you know, high alertness. Well, it turns out that, you know, people, people say all the time, I, I want to feel good. I want to feel good when I wake up. I want to feel like I was 16 again and got a good night's sleep. And there was a recent study done that looked at that. And they said, well, listen, if we take all the good sleepers who have absolutely no sleep problem whatsoever, and we study them, and we ask them to rate their sleep. So we, re we study them in, in the, in the uh, sleep lab, and we look at their sleep, and then we ask them every couple of minutes how good they feel and how alert they are. And if we study tests, psychomotor vigilance tests, and we figure out how good they are at avoiding uh, uh, video passengers or uh, people walking in the street, it turns out that if you wake up at about 6 in the morning, you're foggy. Good sleepers are foggy. And by about 9 a.m., between 9 and 10, you're at your highest alertness. So these are people that have absolutely normal sleep, and they feel foggy when they wake up in the morning. And what we think that is is sleep inertia. Who's taken a nap that's longer than an hour and woken up and felt awful? Oh, I feel awful. We shouldn't take that nap. That's sleep inertia, and we all get that if we sleep at night. If you if you sleep normally and you wake up, wait until about nine o'clock because nine o'clock is going to be your point of maximal alertness. You'll get your best coordination at noon, so exercise would actually be a good time. You get your fastest reaction time at about 3.30, and then high, highest blood pressure about now, um, highest body temperature a little while from now, 
And then we start getting melatonin secretion, and that helps drive this whole process. Now, remember Dr. Kleitman and his medical students? Okay. So what they did is they, they took those guys down, and they only exposed them to red light. And when you have exposure to red light, it doesn't change your, your biologic clock, this circadian clock. And they followed these guys. And what they, what, this, is, this thing is called a, a uh, actograph. And it's what's called a double plot. And just watch this here. So this is one day, and this is the next day. So Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You get the point? And what that does is when we look at that, it allows us to see when we're sleeping. Is it consistent? And what you see in this one is that every day is a little later. So in a 24-hour clock, when we're not exposed to light, our, our, uh, our actual sleep day, how we actually go to sleep, wake up, and, and uh, have our day and go back to sleep again, runs on a 24.2-hour clock. It's actually, they refined it a little bit recently, and they've kind of said, well, it's maybe somewhere between 24.2 and 24.3. That's picking myths. But the point is that it's beyond that. So how, how do you know that the, that the meeting's at 5.30 or my 7 o'clock meeting's at 7 a.m. and I don't show up at 7.15? Well, um, uh, well, I got ahead of myself here. So this circadian rhythm, this circadian rhythm seems to be generated by light, specifically blue wavelength light. And in the light spectrum, that's some, somewhere around 450 uh, uh, nanometers. So that, that blue wavelength light goes into the eye, hits the retina at the back of the eye, goes through a nervous connection to a thing called the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. There'll be a quiz later on that. Okay. But the SCN is the pacemaker. Now, if I don't have eyeballs, if I don't have eyeballs, my sleep is irregular. I can't stay on a 24.2 hour clock. And so I go to sleep whenever I want and I would stay awake whenever I want, and I could care less what time it is. But if I have intact eyes, then I'm okay. Now, it turns out that if I have cataracts, if I'm older, uh, if I have other visual problems, macular degeneration, some of that can affect how robust our circadian clock is. And, ha and as we age, sometimes the circadian clock gets a little goofy too. And that's part of the reason that, that uh, you know, everybody, you, you guys have been to, uh, to Denny's uh, early bird special at three in the afternoon. Okay, when you walk in there, who's there? Everybody's got white hair. Okay? And that's so that and that's the opposite of what happens to teenagers. And that's called advanced. So the clock advances. So you start wanting to go to bed earlier and get up earlier. And that's a physiologic response. And part of that is the circadian clock wear and health. And then other things that affect the circadian clock like vision. Okay? Now, the circadian, more evidence of circadian rhythms, you can see that in when we get sleepiness. So there's periods of times during the day when you're maximally alert and maximally sleepy, and that cycles throughout the day. And if you look at motor vehicle crashes in that time, you can see that, that our highest likelihood of motor vehicle crash is very early. You know, that's when that people, those people that sleep really great are having sleep inertia, and they're commuting to work, and you know, the first cup of coffee hasn't sunk in, and boom, they rear end somebody. But then look down here, crashes go away around noontime. That's when people are maximally alert, and then they come back. So there's this rhythm to how alert and how sleepy we are. Turns out right now it's probably a decent time to grab you guys, because you're more, less likely to fall asleep. Okay. Now, there's circadian rhythmicity to everything. We've known it for a long time that hormones, we talked about growth, growth hormone, insulin, cortisol, cardiovascular times a day when your blood pressure's up. Uh, and blood pressure is down, lungs, kidney function, and how we make urine. So it turns out that if you go to sleep at night and, and, and the plumbing works the right way and you don't have a sleep disorder, your kidneys slow down urine production enough so that you can make it through the night without getting up to pee. That's how it's supposed to go. Um, turns out our immune system and our blood cell functions are actually um, uh, tagged to the circadian rhythmicity. There is literature that says that if you have cancer, and I give you chemotherapy at night when you're asleep, that you're less nauseated and your chemotherapy is more productive. Okay? And there are places that do that. It's, cost of, it's not cost effective. So most of us don't do it. And it's, you know, doctors are asleep, nurses want to be asleep, 
pharmacists have to be up to be able to mix the chemotherapy. So there's a lot of practical issues, but there's some, uh, some information that really says that that might be the right time. And then we talked about temperature, so there's circadian rhythmicity to that. So it turns out that, that uh, you know, here's the Golden State Warriors and the Cavaliers last year. It turns out that there's actually uh, circadian rhythmicity in every part of our body, probably not our hair and our toenails, but in muscles, et cetera. And, and what's been found out is that, is that muscles, liver, spleen, stomach, everything has circadian rhythmicity. And it's part of the reason that, you know, they've done studies where they, they look at West Coast teams and play the East Coast teams in the evening, and who wins? Well, it's more likely that your West Coast team is gonna beat the East Coast team. And so it depends on where and when your circadian rhythm is. Okay. Now, I got ahead of myself here for a minute ago, but so how do we lock into that seven, seven o'clock in the morning meeting? Well, we have this thing called a Zeitgeber, and a Zeitgeber is a German term for the environmental time cue that tells us what time it is, okay? So that might be sunlight, that might be noise, that might be social interaction, it might be alarm clock. Whatever it is, it links you to getting, going to bed at the same time and getting up at the same time. So blue is asleep. These little black dots are movement around in the middle of the night. And then the big black sli uh, slices during the yellow is when we're awake. And this is called a single plot. So it looks different than the last actigraph I showed you, but it's the same idea. And what this shows is that, is that the patients go to bed fairly consistently, get up fairly consistently, and have a, have a decent amount of sleep at night. This is one of my patients here, okay? So if you put all this stuff together, it turns out that, that process age, the homeostatic sleep drive, how long I sleep, the longer I'm awake, the more sleepy I get, the more I sleep, the less I get, I'm sorry, the more rested I become. And alertness level is affected by that as well. Excuse me, process C, the circadian rhythm, shows that it, it alters through the day. And as I go to sleep and go through the night period, I'm ready for the next day. I'm ready to be awake, okay? Now, what happens if I don't get them to sleep? And that's the other part of, 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 the, uh, of our talk here. So it turns out that sleepiness and fatigue get mix, mixed, up, mixed, up, <coughs> mixed up a lot. So sleepiness is the propensity to fall asleep, and it's often incorrectly equated to fatigue and leads to a misdirection of diagnostic tests. So if I go into my doctor and I say, I'm fatigued, very commonly what I'm gonna get is they're gonna check my thyroid function, make sure I'm not anemic, and make sure my electrolytes are fine. They might do an EKG and look at that stuff. But if you say, hey doc, I'm sleepy, I really kind of feel like I need to go to sleep, and when I get sleep, I don't feel like I'm good. With fatigue, when I, when I get sleep, I feel better, but when I have a sleepy problem, I go to sleep and I don't feel good. So that's the difference between sleepiness and fatigue. Now, it turns out that in 1960, Americans slept an average of about eight and a half hours per night, and obesity was 12%. And what we look now, currently, Americans sleep on average about six and a half hours per night, and obesity affects 30% of the population. And the question is, are they linked? I mean, you know, lots, lots of people, you know, I don't need sleep. So sleepiness affects about 5% of our population. That's a lot of people. It's the most common cause of sleep disorder. And no matter what, no matter what disease I treat in my clinic, people don't get enough sleep. You might have sleep apnea, you might have insomnia, you might have this, you might have that. On top of it, one of the other things that people do is they just don't get enough sleep. So it's the most common sleep disorder. Direct cost of, of, of sleepiness is about $275 million per year. Hospitalization costs about $42 million a year. And then there's indirect costs, I mean stuff that we can't even calculate. There's absenteeism, I don't show up to work on Monday because I, I'm just too exhausted, I just can't do it. And then presenteeism, that means that I show up for work but I didn't get my work done. I didn't make so many widgets or I couldn't answer the phone the way I was supposed to or you know, I forgot to listen to my patient's heart, you know, that type of thing. And that stuff is a very real problem. Every couple of years, the National Sleep Foundation f uh, funds a, a survey that they call Sleepiness in America, the Sleep in America survey. And the most recent one done a couple of years ago said, you know, what, ha what happens? How do you feel? Well, 29% of people fall asleep at work, one out of three. 
36% of people draw, drive drowsy or fall asleep on the drowsy, driving rather. And that's one of the questions, you know, do you fall asleep on the traffic when the, uh, when the, the, the red light is there? 20% of people don't want to have sex because they're too tired to, to have sex. 14% miss family or leisure events because they're sleepy. And 20% uh, of the population does some sort of shift work, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And you put it all together, you know, there's about 1,200 fatalities. So people die about 1,200 times a year. And there's about 45,000 disabling. I hurt myself because I was tired at work and I can't go back to work out of uh, injuries that occur. And it's all related to sleepiness. Now, this is a recent survey from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, and it's, a, it's what's called a heat map of the United States by county. So we're over here somewhere. I think we're right there, aren't we? Okay. And what they said was, how much sleep do you get? Do you get less than five? Do you get between five and six, six and seven, seven and eight? You get the point. And what they found was that nationwide, uh, the, uh, it was very likely that people didn't get enough sleep. I and mean, they counted enough sleep as less than seven, I'm sorry, more than seven hours of sleep, okay? Now we're looking pretty good up here in yellow, but still about 24 to 30% of our population slept less than seven hours. That's one in three, right? Okay, look down here. I mean, here's the industrialized parts of our, uh, uh, parts of our country, and then here's everybody gambling over here. So, okay. <laughs> Now watch this, look at this one now. So here's short sleep, boom. Here's obesity rates, look at that. Short sleep, obesity. Is that a coincidence? It turns out it's probably not. So sleep loss contributes to obesity. Sleep problems can impair metabolism. So if I restrict my sleep, uh, I cause an increase in glucose response to breakfast despite normal insulin levels. So when I eat, insulin is produced, okay? and. Um, my pancreas produces it, and it runs around in my bloodstream, and it helps grab the, grab the, uh, the glucose, and that's how we use it, right? So um, if I have a higher glucose, then I'm more likely to sustain that insulin and, and release. And what happens when we do that is that insulin causes adiposity. We get higher levels of insulin, we get more levels of, higher levels of fat, okay? Um, and then sleep restriction um, causes increase in, in, uh, in, um, in hunger. So it turns out that we have two chemicals in our body. One's called leptin and the other one's called ghrelin. Now leptin is produced in, in uh, fat cells. And every fat cell that we have produces leptin in some level. Ghrelin is produced in the stomach. And, and the way it goes is this, is that um, when I get up in the morning, I'm hungry and my ghrelin levels are high and my leptin levels are low. And that says, you're hungry, go get something to eat. And as I go to eat, and as I'm stuffing my, you know, I'm, I'm eating a, uh, what's that, what do they call McDonald's things? McMuffin or, so I'm eating all that. And the ghrelin levels go down, and the leptin levels go up. And it says, okay, put the egg McMuffin down. You're full, okay? So if I get a normal amount of sleep, that's the normal, the normal relationship. Now there were a couple studies done, not too long ago, um, that took normal patients, normal people, no sleep disorder, and they, they took them to salad bar, I'm sorry, to, to buffets, and they measured their calories, their caloric intake, and they, and they watched what they eat. Salad bar, yes, vegetables, yes, meat, yes, potatoes, good, no desserts. And then they sleep deprived these people. And just sleep depriving normal people, the next day what they did is they craved carbohydrates. So when they went back, they started with the pastries and they ate that. And they said, I'm not eating vegetables. I earned a, I earned a, I ate a pastry. So what they, what they simultaneously did is they measured leptin and ghrelin. And what they found was that leptin levels go down when you restrict your sleep and ghrelin levels uh, go up. And the ratio there increases. So what that says is that ghrelin, the hunger hormone, trumps the satiety hormone. So a, a hunger increases by 23%. And what we specifically crave is, is carbohydrates, okay? And I've experienced this myself, you know, being on call, working all night. The next day, all I want is a donut. And I'm sure you guys have too. Now, so what that turns is a, is a, is a normal weight individual to someone that's heavy and obese. Now, what's this? What's with the mouse? Well, it turns out that they can, they can uh, breed leptin knockout mice. 
what that means is that mouse here has no leptin. He's got no satiety hormone in his body. He has unopposed ghrelin. And that's very similar to what happens when you, uh, when you don't get enough sleep. Here's a normal mouse for comparison, okay? I think that these were actually cloned brothers. Do they get the same caloric intake? Yes. Uh, uh, no, no, they have free access. But hang on just a sec, because I've got the answer to that. So if you look at eating the wrong, at the wrong time, you know, there's this, there's this thought now that, that part of the reason that we gain weight and we can't get it off is that we're eating at the wrong time. And, and the thought is that we should eat within a 12-hour period. You guys, have you heard this yet? It's hit the newspapers and the magazines. So you're supposed to be eat within a 12-hour period. Um, if you eat outside of that, that leads to adiposity. And it also leads to other things. So uh, to prove that point, what they have is, is uh, two rats. Now, now, mice and rats, typically, they're awake at night, and they eat at night, and they're asleep during the day, and they don't eat. So what they did with these, with these uh, rats is they took uh, a rat and they allowed them to eat a high fat diet in the dark when they would normally eat. And then they didn't feed them during the day when they would normally sleep. And then they took the other, same, same type of rat, it wasn't a leptin knockout rat. Uh, and, and during the light, they didn't feed him. So that's his nighttime. And they fed him during the daytime. And what they found was that the body, rate, the body um, uh, the body mass, so their weights, rose su substantially. At the end of this, they reversed it, and they fed the other guy the other way, and, and went, went opposite, and the, the, the skinny mouse gained weight, and the fat mouse lost weight. Okay. So, if you're not getting enough sleep, and you have higher insulin, and you eat more, because you're really hungry, what happens when you gain all that weight? Well, there's a variety of different things, and this is not an exhaustive list, but we see lung problems that occur. Obstructive sleep apnea is one of the more common illnesses. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, so just by eating too much and sleeping too little, you can put fat in your liver. Cholesterol is made in the liver, and, and it can't get out. And that's one of the more common causes of cirrhosis these days. It's actually fatty infiltration of the liver from being obese causes more cirrhosis than alcohol these days. You get gallbladder disease. You can have gynecologic abnormalities where you miss your menses and develop this thing called polycystic ovary disease. You wear your joints out, your skin can change, you get gout. Um, there's there's a, a condition where the inside of the brain will actually develop high blood pressure. Uh, it's called pseudotumor cerebri. And, and um, um, people will get chronic headaches and visual changes. Um, you're at risk for stroke and developing cataracts. There's all sorts of heart problems, and this can be linked to diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure that occurs. And, and here's, the, here's the very interesting one. It turns out that being heavy increases the likelihood to develop a cancer. Um, and there's a variety of different cancers where, where things are, are, are influenced. Now stay, uh, remember that thought here. So uh, melatonin. Okay, so people try the melatonin, and, and I hear that all, all the time. You can buy it over the counter. Um, and the, the story on melatonin is that it's actually a, a night hormone. Uh, so in rats, in rats they, get it, they get it during the day, and, and mice get it during the day, and humans, we get it during the, during the afternoon and overnight. And it helps us organize our sleep. So it's the add-on. It's one of the extra things we do. And what happens is that same thing, that suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus, stimulates the superior cervical ganglion down here in the neck, and then that stimulates the pineal gland to, reduce, uh, to release melatonin. And we can measure that experimentally. You know, I've been doing sleep medicine for a couple of years now, and, and uh, I've never ordered a melatonin test. There's three labs in the world that measure it, and periodically they get goofy, so they have to close down and recalibrate. So the only people that really measure melatonin levels are are uh, uh, people that do it experimentally. And the way you do it is you chew a cotton ball every hour. Um, and then they'll measure the salivary melatonin will start popping up and you'll see when it starts to go. And what, what, we, uh, what we see is this circadian rhythm that melatonin tends to go up. Now if you suppress, let me just see, I got this out of order. So in an evening, typically about two hours before our normal bedtime, melatonin starts to rise. And then about two hours before the normal bedtime, it starts to, uh, it, it dips down. And then it stays low throughout the day. 
and then goes up. So there's a cycle to that. And that's why, that's why we consider measuring it, or would consider measuring it. When we're looking for a circadian rhythm disorder, you know, the, the older patient that wants to go to Denny's to eat supper at three in the afternoon, or the high school kid that won't, won't go to bed before two in the morning. So we're looking to figure all that stuff out. And we can actually measure your sal salivary melatonin. And if I see your salivary melatonin doesn't start peaking until, uh, start going up until one o'clock in the morning, I know that you don't want to go to bed until about three. And I know that you have a delayed sleep phase syndrome and we can help adjust that. And vice versa, you know, if you want to go to bed at five because you had dinner at three, then we could look at it that way. Now we do that clinically and we do with that, that, the lot, the actigraph that I showed you before. But it turns out that, that the people that get really screwed up with the circadian and more commonly than the, than the Denny's person in the high school are the people that work shift. Because if you work a night shift, you don't know what that can do. Because most people, most people work the night shift because they like the lifestyle. They get to work at night and they can stay up all day. How sweet is that? I get paid to be, to be alive. I get paid to stay up all day. And, and that's how they do it. So what most people do is they work all night, they come home, they get an hour or two of sleep, and then they're up, and then maybe they may nap a little bit, and then they go to work and they try and get through their night. Sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. And then on their days off, they flip back over. So they go to bed at night and they stay up during the day. That's what most people do. And that's the wrong way to do it for a variety of different reasons. Most people do that gain weight, they have high blood pressure, it's been found to be a risk factor in ladies that large nurse trial, they followed nurses for 30 years. What they found was that the nurses that worked night shift got breast and ovarian cancer at a higher level. And you were worse if you worked in the dark. So any nurses here? No, so nurse. Work night shift ever? Mm -hmm. What happens at night, what do you do? Patients are sleeping, you turn the lights off, right? Yeah. You work, in the, you work, yeah. Yeah, so that's what happens. So these guys are nurses who work at night work in the dark, okay? And then they periodically get exposed to bright light. And then they go home and they try and sleep. So their melatonin doesn't know what it's doing. Well, it turns out that melatonin is actually a good thing. So releasing your melatonin like it's supposed to do here actually turns out to be an anti-inflammatory. It's an antioxidant. It's an anti-cancer. There's a whole body of work looking at this stuff where, where having normal melatonin levels fights cancer and prevents cancer cells from growing. And you don't get that if you don't sleep normally, okay? So, now, put it all together here. So I'm sleep deprived, my leptin levels go down, my ghrelin levels go up, the ratio changes, I'm hungry. Give me a cheeseburger, give me a donut. I have increased opportunity to eat. I have altered thermal regulation. My circadian rhythm is off. I don't, I don't sleep right and, and my body is, is messed up. I have increased fatigue, not sleepiness, but fatigue. And I have increased stress hormone that occurs because it, you know, uh, not going to sleep is a stress state. You have increased in catecholamines, you have increased in cortisol. What happens is you get reduced energy expenditure because you're too tired to exercise. You increase your caloric intake and you develop obesity. And that is a risk factor for developing sleep apnea, which affects 30 million people in this country. Okay. 30 million people, think of that. 10% of the population. All right, so what happens if you have obesity and you develop sleep apnea and you say, I'm not treating that. Well, look at this. This is not, uh, not uh, comprehensive. You get altered glucose metabolism. It makes you have diabetes. You get high cholesterol. You develop what's called the metabolic syndrome, meaning you're working on, uh, working on diabetes, but you're not quite there yet. You get fat in the liver. You're a risk factor for developing asthma. Remember that leptin, that leptin level? Well, it turns out leptin's a big molecule, and it's big enough to circulate in the bloodstream and get trapped in the lung. And what happens is that people who do that are more commonly associated, I'm sorry, more likely to develop asthma. So there's a risk factor between asthma and sleep apnea. Chronic renal fa kidney failure. So people with, with untreated sleep <coughs> apnea have enough inflammatory chemicals running around, they poison their kidney. They develop reflux because they're doing that all night and they suck, they suck their esophagus. They get high blood pressure, they get high, pressure, high blood pressure in their lungs, they develop heart failure, they get irregular heart rhythms, et cetera, et cetera. Now the key things down here is neurocognitive dysfunction. If I have obstructive sleep apnea and I'm tired, then I have, I have a higher risk for developing neuro, neurocognitive dysfunction, meaning my brain doesn't work right. 
and I'm at high risk for developing dementia. Now, sleep and cognition, that's a segue for this. So it turns out, you guys know this guy, Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, okay, changed our lives. So Thomas Edison was notorious. He, he uh, bragged about never sleeping more than three or four hours. And, and he coined the term, sleep is for wimps. And, and he writes about it in his literature, and he says, listen, you know, um, humanity is suffering because they sleep too much. Sleep is like a drug. Take too much at a time, and it makes you dopey. You lose, you lose time and opportunities. So he did his best to work on a light bulb. And he, he, uh, uh, he promoted the notion that all you needed to do was nap during the day. Now, if somebody went back and, and actually recorded his diary, reviewed his diary, and they found out he was actually sleeping about eight to nine hours per night, but he was doing it in little chunks. And there's, I went back and looked through the internet, there's hundreds of pictures of this guy asleep. So, but, but yet he told you that you should, you were a wimp if you got sleep. So, sleep and vigilance. So it turns out that the military and NASA have sponsored a ton of research about this. And this is just one. I mean, this is, this is just a small, uh, a, a, a small study. But what, what it shows is that if I get less than nine hours of sleep per night, if I expose you to things, psychomotor vigilance tests, that's the flight test where I try not to crash my airplane, or the driving test where I try not to hit the pedestrian to crash my car and stay on the road. So if I sleep nine hours a night over a seven day period, my scores are pretty good and they're pretty consistent. But if I get eight hours of sleep, if I get seven hours of sleep, my scores start to deteriorate over a seven day period. If I hit five hours, I'm a mess. Five hours. And in fact, if there are conditions where we tell people, hey, listen, you need to cut down the amount of sleep and the opportunity in your bed, you need to cut it down. But we never go below five hours because people are a mess when they go down to five. Down to three, look at this. I mean, you're killing every pedestrian and crashing every airplane you put on that simulator. Now, what they've done there is they've done IQ points too. And what they found is that if you get less than nine hours of sleep, your IQ points start to drop. And the general rule is that if you get less than seven hours of sleep, for every hour, for the first hour, you drop your IQ point one. For the second hour, you drop it two. For the third hour, you drop it four points. So it's, it's exponential. And it keeps going after that. Now, what happens if I deprive myself of sleep? Well, I become irritable, right? I'm not motivated to do anything, I develop anxiety, I get depressed, uh, drug-resistant depression is a very common thing, I get lack of concentration, I get attention deficits, I'm not paying attention, it takes me longer behind the wheel to react to somebody breaks in front of me, I'm forgetful, I talked about the lower IQ, it's more easily that somebody's gonna interrupt you, you can't multitask very well. Uh, won't have any energy, I'll start talking about that fatigue, and, and on and on. So there's a variety of different things that sleep deprivation will cause. And if you look at over the, you know, just over the past 30 years, look at the major accidents we've had that are all directly attributable to, to sleepiness. You know, we, there was, a, there was a, an accident, a plane accident, where the, the pilot crashed the plane, he was landing in the Little Rock, you know, killed 24 and injured 100. Uh, there's the Chernobyl accident that occurred at night while somebody was sleeping. The Exxon Valdez, you know, the the the, uh, the, the captain and pilot had been uh, had been drinking and went to bed tired, not drunk but tired, and crashed the ship. Three Mile Island was related to being sleepy. There's been two recent subway crashes in New York. Uh, the first, this one is the one where the guy the guy didn't stop at the station. He just drove right through the station. They found out that he had severe sleep apnea. He was asleep at the wheel. And then the, the challenger, you know, they blamed it on the O-ring, but, but the, the ultimate problem was that the guy who checked the O-ring was tired, okay? So, now, sleep and memory. We talked about neurocognitive function. So it turns out that there's different types of memory. There's short-term memory, there's long-term memory, and, and then there's subtypes of long-term memory. And I'm not an expert in this. There's declarative memory, and that's kind of like knowing what. And there's non-declarative memory, and that's kind of like knowing how. So declarative memory, I kind of think of as, you know, was, who was the first president of the United States? Everybody knows it was Abraham Lincoln, right? No, that's not right. Okay? And then, and then the, uh, the non-declarative is how to hit a golf ball or hit a tennis ball. And, and then there's other subtypes. But here, look at this side. 
So it turns out that for you to be able to remember those things, you need sleep. And if you don't get sleep, you can, and you don't get normal sleep, so here's all those sleep, here's slow wave sleep, here's that workhorse N2 sleep, here's REM sleep. You need to have all of those sleeps to be able to remember things. And if you don't do that, then you're in trouble. Now it turns out that, that um, there's this little thing called the hippocampus in our brain, and that acts like a clearinghouse for memories. So the things that you guys are, are learning today, if you're a right-handed person, go into the left temporal parietal lobe of the brain. That's where short-term memory goes. And then at night, the hippocampus grabs it when you're asleep, if you have N3 sleep, if you have REM sleep, and if you have N2 sleep. And that gets, cir that gets circulated into the prefrontal cortex. And then, tomorrow, I know George Washington was the first president of the United States, right? Not Abraham Lincoln. So this thing they call the CA, the cornu ammonis, and it's, it's, it was named, so the pathologists have figured this stuff out. Um, he had nothing better to do, so he looked at this, this, uh, uh, this Egyptian god, um, uh, Amon, and he said that that looks like his horn. So we're going to call it uh, the, the cornu ammonis. And the specific, or, uh, the specific spot we're looking at is right here, the CA3. And that's where memory is stored, and that's where um, sleep affects our memory. And it turns out that this guy has a really wimpy blood supply that is affected by low oxygen levels. What causes low oxygen levels? Sleep apnea. Okay. So, turns out that if you don't get enough sleep, then what's directly affected is all these things in the prefrontal cortex that work on what's called executive function. So analytical and figural reasoning, visual spatial, spatial memory, mathematical approximation. If I'm a sleepy guy and my hippocampus doesn't work, then I can't do math very well. And that's, I, I hear people, all the guys all the time in particular, they'll come in and say, yeah, you know, I'm a contractor. And I haven't been sleeping real well. But, you know, I didn't come in because, you know, I could do my job, but I can't do math anymore. I hear that all the time, okay? So, now remember that N3 sleep, you know, that, that those big waves that we showed? Well, it turns out that, that they come from the front part of your brain. And, and the red, the deeper the red, the more slow wave activity. Remember I said uh, young people have big uh, slow waves, right? And they're, that's linked to growth hormone. Well, it's also uh, linked to memory. So little kids, are, their brains are like sponges and they're soaking up everything. And they need sleep to get there because this, this allows their brain to develop normally. And if you measure older adults, older, 70 and greater, you can see that their slow wave sleep goes down. And there's evidence that, that links this lack of slow wave sleep, this lack of the ability to remember in older people to sleep, so lack of sleep. And we see this quite a bit where, where our patients go to sleep at night and they just don't have much in the way of N3 sleep. And, and for example here, this is a 15 second window of that sleep. So that we have a little kid here hooked up the way I showed you that guy before. And, and look at these waves. These are big, slow waves, big slow waves. This little kid's sopping up. He's, he's putting things into his prefrontal cortex and he's developing his executive, fu executive functioning. Now here's an older person. I think this person was 76, and another one of my patients. And here's what scored as N3 sleep. Look at the difference in the waves, okay? So there's some thought that that's why we become more forgetful. One of the components of why we come, become forgetful as we age. <coughs> so, so every couple of years, National Sleep Foundation does that sleep in America, but they also review all the literature, and then they tell us how much we have to sleep. And, you know, years ago, they did a study in San Francisco where they, they took college kids and everybody knows they need eight hours of sleep, right? How'd they come up with that? Well, yeah, no, that's good, that's good. But it turns out that the way they figured that out is that um, uh, they took college kids and they said, you wanna make some money? College kids will do anything for money. So they took them in and they put them in, like Dr. Like Dr. Kleitman's uh, dark room, they put them in a low level room, low level light. They said, you can do your homework, do your college work, we'll pay you. When you're hungry, ring the bell, we'll come get some, we'll bring you food. When you're tired, go to sleep. And what they found was that, is that as they got in there, all the kids slept more and more and more and more. Eight, 10, 12 hours, way up here. 
And then they started oscillating around 8.3 hours. And that's where that eight hours of sleep came from, from the 1970s. Well, somewhere along the line, uh, the National Sleep Foundation said, yeah, you know, that's pretty good. Eight hours of sleep, it's a good goal. Not everybody can get that, so why don't you get at least six to eight? Okay. So this last time, uh, they, they reviewed this in 2016. And in 2016, they reviewed 5,000 peer-reviewed articles. And the group of them put together, and they said, guys, we're off. So it's, it's not six to eight, but for adults, it should be seven to nine. So if you're getting less than seven hours of sleep, and that's where that obesity stuff comes from, if you're getting less than seven hours of sleep, that's not healthy. Now it turns out, it turns out that there's a there's a survival curve for sleep, and it's a U-shaped survival curve. And the survival curve goes like this. So over here, you didn't live very long, over here you didn't live very long, and right here is seven hours. So for some reason, there's a mortality benefit to sleeping seven, but not six, and not eight. Now, now all this stuff is not hard, I mean, that's hard science, but you know why that happened in this group? Again, that was a group of nurses that they studied it on. The nurses that said that they slept seven hours were alive longer over this 30 year trial than people that said they sleep slept less than seven or more than seven, okay? So, so for uh, newborns, we're looking for 12 to 18 hours of sleep. For infants, 14 to 15. Toddlers at one to three, we're still looking for 12. And it starts to go down. Teenagers, even though they, they sleep differently and they seem to sleep longer, they actually still need about eight and a half to nine and a half hours, but their sleep period is gonna be shifted. And then with adults, anybody 18 and older needs about seven to nine, okay? So what I, I hope that I impressed upon you guys over the last 40 minutes or so, or no, over the last hour, uh, is that instead of being this inconsequential thing that's a luxury and you don't really need it, sleep is actually the foundation of, of good health. And it's actually of the things, nutrition, fitness, cognitive, sleep is actually the most important because it's the thing that gets you there, the thing, the thing that makes you healthy. So how do you get a good night's sleep? And you can read this you can read this anywhere. If you Google today, go home and Google on MSN and you'll find out how do you sleep better. So now you guys understand why. So maintain a regular sleep-wake cycle. You want to maintain your circadian rhythm. You want to feed your circadian, uh, your suprachiasmatic <coughs> nucleus. Refrain from taking naps. Why? Because that adversely affects your homeostatic sleep drive. The longer I stay up, the easier it is to go to sleep. So if I take a nap, I'm going to interrupt that. If I avoid caffeine after mid-afternoon, that's pretty good. If caffeine seems to affect me, I cut it out altogether. Same with nicotine. You know, you shouldn't be smoking anyway. Um, exercise, but not within three hours of bedtime. Well, it turns out that exercise is actually good. When you exercise, it helps build proteins that run the circadian clock. The suprachiasmatic nucleus feeds on the proteins that come out of exercise. So we know that people sleep better when they exercise. Why is that? It's that, that, that fact. Best time to exercise if you can, right around lunch time. <clears throat> if you can't exercise, the, the, the National Sleep, the, I'm sorry, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine recently changed the rules. They said, listen, you guys exercise so poorly, we don't care when you exercise, even right before bedtime, just do it. So, but ideally, you wouldn't want to do it because it helps, it delays, when you raise your core body temperature, it delays slow wave sleep onset. And as you drop your core, your core body temperature down, that promotes slow wave sleep. So after you exercise, you'll be alert for about three hours, your body temperature goes down, and you normally want to go to sleep. Establish a relaxing routine before bedtime. Everybody needs a Zeitgeber, okay? Remember that term. When you were little kids, your mom and dad, they fed you, they let you play, they put you in the bathtub, they, they gave you a splashy bath, they dried you off and put you in your onesie, they gave, you a, uh, they gave you something to eat, a snack, they brushed your teeth, they put you in bed and read a story, they gave you a kiss and walked out the bedroom, right? Okay, that is a Zeitgeber. And no matter how old you are, you need a Zeitgeber to be able to sleep well. Limit your exposure to alcohol. It disrupts sleep, it makes sleep much worse. It, uh, it, acts, as a, um, it acts as a sedative when you first take it, and after it's metabolized, after about three to four hours, it works as a stimulant. Alcohol is the most common the most common sleep aid in the country. Use bedroom for sleep activities and sex. So 
So when that's, you get two things in there, that's it. You get to change your clothes and you have sex and you sleep. I'm sorry, that's three. So and that's it, get out of the bedroom. That way the bedroom is a place where you go to sleep. Set the environment. You want to make sure the noise isn't you know, disrupted, that the temperature, that the light is okay. And then try to get at least seven to nine hours sleep. Now, I said seven to nine hours, and that's kind of, that's, that's the gospel. But in reality, we all have our own. I know, because I'm a sleep geek, that my sleep is seven hours. And if I get six by the end of the week, I need sleep, and I do recovery sleep, what's called social jet lag, okay? So I sleep more on the weekend. By Monday, I'm kind of ready to go. Well, there's been recent data, and you guys probably all do the same. Even if you're working and retired, you're probably busy, and that's what you do. This social jet lag, where you cheat, sleep, and sleep in on the weekend. Remember that psychomotor, uh, psychomotor vigilance test and the IQ points? Well, it turns out that you get a little bump, that you recover. But on Monday, when you go right back, you're right back here. Okay, So it doesn't start here, it starts there. So your psychomotor vigilance test stopped, uh, uh, let, uh, start over again where you left off, like it's Friday again. Okay, So get sleep. You can bank sleep. We used to tell people you can't bank sleep. It's not one-to-one. -one. Well, it turns out that if I know I'm going to be busy for a week, if I, if I have to work in the intensive care unit for a week, then the week before I go in, if I get extra sleep, if I bank my hours, then my vigilance and my IQ points are better the week I'm sleep deprived than if I don't. Again, this is the military doing this stuff. This is NASA. They don't want their astronauts. We don't want our, our, our military personnel killed. So these are the people driving this stuff. So it's unequivocal. There's large bodies of literature that says that we should do that. Okay. So if you, uh, if you think of us, uh, you know, lucky to work with these, these nice ladies. This is Dr. Uman. Uh, Dr. Uman is a new sleep doc. She just came. Um, sleep doctors come in a variety of different flavors. I'm a lung doctor and an intensive care unit doctor. Dr. Uman is a neurologist. So her specialty was, uh, was diseases of the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. And, and she got jazzed by sleep and, and, uh, and joined. So she's joined us now. And then uh, I have two physician's assistants. Uh, some of you guys may know them, uh, Jessica and Sarah. And the, these ladies are very wonderful. And uh, you know, if you have friends or family that, that uh, uh, need, uh, need us to, to take a peek, we'd be happy to take care of you. So, and then, so remember Dr. Dement, the, the REM guy? So here he is. Uh, this is a little while ago. So here he is. And this, this goofy guy with the, with the Hawaiian shirt is me over there. So Dement's a pretty cool guy. He's, he's 97 now, and he's still working. So anyway, but thanks for your attention. That's all I got. So go yes. I've got, I've got like five minutes. I've got a meeting uh, that I have to go to, but uh, I'd be happy to entertain uh, a couple of questions if anybody had anything. Yes, ma'am. Is it possible to have sleep apnea with no overt symptoms? Uh, yeah, it's more common with guys. So guys, I tell you, I'm not sleeping. Uh, I'm only here because my wife told me I had to come in. But, uh, but yeah, you can have sleep apnea. Uh, the, the big question is, uh, if you have sleep apnea and you're asymptomatic and you're otherwise healthy, what do you do with it? And the answer is we don't know. So, yes, ma'am. If you have sleep apnea and you have the, the test, do you need to be tested again at any certain point or does it just stay the same? Uh, yeah, you know, if you've had the test and we figure things out and you get therapy, uh, then, you know, usually you're good for life. Now. That, that's the short answer. The long answer is that it depends on your insurance. And if you're, if you're a good girl and you wear your CPAP or do your treatment for, a, you know, with, for the sleep apnea and it's uninterrupted and, and things work well and you're feeling good, you never have to have another test. But if you interrupt therapy or your machine breaks and you weren't using it or um, uh, if you're having trouble, then we sometimes have to send you back for another test. Yeah. So it's quite variable. So. Did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> these, these ladies over here, they're my bosses, so they, they uh, run the sleep lab in the medical supply company. Yes, sir? That social lag catch-up time? Yeah. <clears throat> Is it double down when you're a shift worker and you're not working? 
where you have normal Saturday, Sunday weekends, but your weekends are, could be Tuesday, Wednesday, and then the next shift, it's... Yeah, it doesn't really matter where your weekend shows up. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the cumulative sleep loss. So acute is cumulative. Is it okay to exercise first thing in the morning? Because I feel like it kind of helps me wake up, but I, looking at the groggy thing, it made me wonder. Yeah, yeah, so sleeping, uh, I'm sorry, waking up and exercising is actually okay. I mean, it's your personal preference. Some people can't get going, and some people, you know, that's what they do. Um, so there's been some data that says that if you don't get enough sleep and you get up early to exercise, um, that's actually detrimental to your health. So if you're not getting sleep and you get up early because you didn't exercise yesterday, mm -hmm. that's bad. But if you get up and you're feeling pretty good and you got your normal amount of sleep, then it's okay to exercise. Yeah, and, and people will, t will tell you that. And, and uh, so those teenagers that, that don't sleep right, when we get them fixed, we exercise them first thing in the morning. And the adults who go to bed too early, we exercise them in the evening. So, you know, so it, it depends on where you are. Yes, sir. I've seen some stuff in <clears throat> talking about sleep hygiene where it talks about screen time and looking at yeah. tablets or phones or TV or whatever. How detrimental is that to your ability to get to sleep or if you wake up and look at that? Does yeah. that affect the quality of sleep or just your ability to sleep? So it's, that's a good question. And three weeks ago, I would have told you something totally different than right now because there's recent literature that got presented at that meeting uh, that I was at um, that said, uh, so up till now, the literature kind of says that, that if you get a blue wavelength um, exposure in the, middle, in, the, in the evening at a time when you want to go to bed, when your brain says, it's time to go to bed, and you say, uh -uh, I'm going to read on my iPad, and you read, and you expose yourself to blue wavelength light, then that delays it, just like telling your brain you don't want to go to bed for two hours. So then falling asleep, sleep onset insomnia, is very common. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you're exposed to that same blue wavelength light, and by the way, my slides are red, but no matter what color the slides are, the light coming off this monitor is blue, and my eyes see that even though I'm not aware of it. Okay, So uh, if you do that in the middle of the night, it will also lock you in. So I see a lot of people that you know they get insomnia and they can't sleep, so they get up and they turn the computer on, they play solitaire until they're tired again and then they go back to bed, and the next night they wake up at the same time, and the next night, and the next night, so they develop a pattern. So what we've been, uh, what we've been trying to do is uh, to uh, avoid that, and, and the way to do that is to give uh, either um, um, an amber-colored glass, okay, so amber glasses block out blue wavelength light, and they sell them on the internet, you can buy them, if you're interested in this, there's a company, you can buy them on Amazon for like eight bucks, and it's called, the company sells them, it's called Uvex, U-V-E-X, and, and you, can buy, you can buy the glasses. So the thought is that if you block the blue wavelength blue wave like light, then you won't wake up in the middle of the night um, and, and uh, won't delay your bedtime. And in fact, there's a big industry on this, and I, I've been telling my patients for several years now, um, get the computer program that turns off the blue wavelength light that comes out of your computer screen at night and you'll be okay. And there's a free program uh, that's very reliable called f.lux, f.lux. Um, and you can download that for free and put it on every, all your devices. I have it on all my devices and I still use it, to fight, despite the fact that two recent studies came out that said uh, those things don't work. Um, that they've done studies on adults and, and what they found is that the blue wavelength blocking computer programs don't work, they don't block enough, and that uh, adults who are exposed to blue wavelength light don't alter their time. So right now it's kind of a mess. So what I would say is to be safe, do what I do, uh, and try to limit your exposure, limit your screen time for about two hours, and that won't suppress your melatonin release. It'll get your brain ready to want to go to bed. And then in the middle of the night, if you get up, uh, try to limit your exposure indirect light for something behind you, uh, try to read a book and not an iPad and stay off the computer unless you have a, an amber color glass. So, that answer your question? Yeah, so I don't know the answer. That's, you know, that's the answer. Is it okay to take melatonin? Yeah, so, the, so that's a great question. Uh, 
So the, it turns out, remember that uh, it goes in through the eye, melatonin, and then it goes down to the cervical ganglion, and then it comes back up. So the neck is part of it. And it turns out there are certain medications that block that, so the melatonin can't be released. And the class of drugs that does that is called a beta blocker. Uh, so things like uh, propranolol, metoprolol, that type, they block melatonin release. So that if you take melatonin, studies kind of show that, that guys, oh, I'm sorry, that, that people get about 38 minutes of extra sleep if you if you take a, if you take melatonin, if you if you have uh, if you are on those medications. Okay. Now, um, it turns out that if you take all of the melatonins that you can collect, Rose Hours, Costco, wherever, um, uh, Bozeman Health Pharmacy, and you analyze them, you can have anywhere between zero and whatever the drug says they have in there as far as melatonin goes. Okay. So you don't know what you're getting when you buy melatonin at Costco or Rose Hours or, or Bozeman Health. You just don't know. So what's advised is that if you really want to use melatonin the right way, that you get what's called pharmaceutical grade melatonin. And if you Google pharmaceutical grade melatonin, there are several of them that pop up and you can buy them without a prescription on the internet. And then the thought is that, well, if you buy a one milligram tablet, you get a one milligram or two or three. So how much do you need? Well, I don't know. Um, the, the brain, the pineal gland, redu releases about a half a milligram of melatonin per night. Um, and that's normal. If you're on beta blockers, it may not even release that. Uh, there, so what we recommend is that, you know, try it, titrate it, see how things go. But in general, probably one or two or maybe three milligrams. And if you go down to Costco, you get a jumbo 500 tablets, you know, for 20 bucks of a three milligram tablet. And, and that seems to be fairly well, but there's no quality control on that. Um, there are some diseases where we, we actually give higher doses, but we never tend to go above, uh, literature is confusing, 12 milligrams to 15 milligrams. That's the maximum, it depends. You never go above that because there are studies and people take wacky doses of melatonin. I've had people tell me they take 200 milligrams of melatonin. Just imagine three milligram pills and you take it 200 milligrams. You know, you are stuffed by the time you get to bed. Okay. But um, what happens is if you take anything around the 50 milligram dose, it causes coronary vasospasm. So it increases the risk that you develop a heart attack. When are you susceptible to a heart attack? Overnight. Okay. So too much melatonin can hurt you. Um, and probably one, two, or three milligrams, which is what most people get, is probably okay. Good. Did you have one more question? To have her oh, question. Oh, her question. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.